All right. Um, well, my name is Jen Golden. I am the past past president of Braille Literacy Canada, and it's a pleasure to be here with you all this afternoon. And it's also a pleasure to introduce our uh, next session and um, more specifically the speaker. So um, here we are with what is the science of reading and what does it teach us about Braille contractions? And our speaker is Dr. Robert Engelbretson, who is the um, sorry my braille display just who is the chair of the linguistics department at rice university i know i should have your bio memorized shouldn't i <laughs> uh, <laughs> where he teaches courses in linguistic analysis discourse and grammar field methods and research on braille he's done field work in indonesia which we'll have to talk about sometime because i have been to indonesia and has authored a book and several articles on colloquial indonesian grammar um, dr engelbertson's focus on braille research began in 2006 when he was appointed to the International Council on English Braille, ICEB, Committee on Linguistics and Foreign Languages. In this role, he revised and published a Braille version of the International Phonetic Al Alphabet, IPA, to empower better access to phonetics for blind and visually impaired people working in language related fields. Um, I should have gone to school about 15 years later. I could have benefited from that. In November of 2019, the Braille Authority of North America, BANA, recognized Dr. Engelbretson with the Darlene Bogart Braille Excellence Award for this work. Also in 2019, a team of resource, a team of researchers, including Dr. Engelbretson, Simon Fisherbaum from Rice University, and our very own Kay Holbrook from uh, UBC, uh, British Columbia, were awarded an exploration research grant from the Institute for Education Sciences. And there's um, a lot more information on the award, I'm not going to give the uh, the award number necessarily, but there, this bio is actually on our the BLC website, so you can check it out there to find out the details about this award. It's called the Exploring Knowledge, Skills, and Strategies Teachers of Students with Visual Impairments Need to Effectively Teach Braille Reading and Writing. His work seeks to bring Braille research squarely into the mainstream of reading science sciences and to contribute to evidence-based approaches to improving braille literacy so robert i was actually going to email you and ask you if there was anything else you wanted me to include and i forgot until today and so i thought that would just be mean so i'm going to let you add to that whatever you'd like and with that i will hand things over to you well thank you jen i think that's probably already too much so i'm not going to add anything but <laughs> it's really great to be here thanks for the introduction and thanks for the invitation to talk to you today uh, I am going to, uh, so I noticed that uh, Natalie sent around the slides uh, already. So if, uh, if you need those, um, the Word version has an accessible uh, description of a rather complex figure. So I would recommend using the Word version if you need that. Uh, in, that uh, in that Word document, my Braille examples are in Unicode Braille. So that may or may not work for you depending on what Braille translator you're using or what you're viewing it in. If you're using JAWS, it should be fine. On the first slide here, I've got my email address. If you want to contact me, uh, you're more than welcome to. It's reng at rice.edu. It's probably one of the shortest email addresses on the planet. And I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, the reading sciences, which really would take a couple of semesters, so we're not going to get very far in that. And I'm going to then talk to you about some work that my colleagues and collaborators and I are doing uh, from a reading science perspective about Braille contractions. So. Um, you know, reading is really quite a, a remarkable human achievement uh, when you think about it. You know, you just think of all of the things that has to happen within milliseconds. You have to perceive what you're reading, either visually or tactily. You have to recognize the word. Uh, it may activate the sound of the word, activate the meaning of the word, understand how the word fits into the sentence that you're reading and the overall text and comprehend what you're reading. and all of these many, many more things happening in a matter of milliseconds. It's really quite uh, remarkable what the human brain is able to do, especially given, as Marianne Wolf likes to say, humans were not meant to read, right? There is no reading gene. There's nothing in our genetics that makes us readers. There's no region of the brain that's specific to reading. Reading is only about 6,000 years old, so, uh, and, and it has to be taught and learned. Uh, it doesn't uh, just sort of happen naturally. And because of that, reading relies on other systems. Reading sort of piggybacks on uh, areas of the brain that are designed and functionally do other things. 
uh, so the visual or tactile perception, spoken language, pattern recognition, and so on. And learning to read actually changes the physical structure of the brain. That's a great example of what we call neuroplasticity. And I think it's just amazing that this thing that we do uh, actually rewires the brain, gives us new uh, connections, new networks. The reading brain is very different from the non-reading brain in that sense. So um, that's, uh, there we go, sorry about that. That's one of the things that reading scientists are um, like to point out. Um, okay, I'm moving on to slide three for those that are following uh, on the handout. Uh, what is the science of reading? Well, the science of reading is interested in understanding from uh, neural, perceptual, cognitive, and linguistic underpinnings of reading and writing. So what is this thing that we do when we read and write? How does it work? What are its parts? What does it mean to know how to read and write? How are these skills typically learned? Why do some people struggle to learn them? And it's an interdisciplinary science. It relies on uh, fields like uh, cognitive neuroscience and psychology and linguistics and education. Uh, we seek to, uh, to do replicable studies, so studies that can be repeated and verified and or, uh, or falsified. Uh, it's research-based. And um, um, uses methodologies such as neuroimaging, experimental studies, and analysis of large-scale data. Uh, on slide four here, I've put some, uh, all of these are going to be on the final, there'll be, there'll be a test on this, but I put some recommended readings, uh, which if you're interested in this, you may want to check out. So the first one is a journal article that is really excellent, uh, called Ending the Reading Wars, Reading Acquisition from Novice to Expert. Uh, it's in the Journal of uh, Psychological Science and the Public Interest. It's open access, so you can just click on the, the website and read it. Uh, the next two uh, are a book by Mark Seidenberg uh, and uh, then Marianne Wolf's book, uh, Proust and the Squid, The Story and Science of the Reading Brain. Uh, both of those are available on Bookshare. I don't know if they're available uh, to Canadian uh, Braille and Talking Book Libraries, but if not, they should be. So I would, if you're interested in this topic, I would encourage you to read uh, one or more of these things. They don't really talk about Braille, though, which is part of the problem, that uh, Braille research has been rather late to come to the reading sciences, and the reading sciences have been rather late to recognize Braille as an area that, that is in need of uh, evidence-based research. Uh, there are exceptions, of course, but that's generally been true. So fluent reading requires fast, automatic recognition of patterns. So patterns like grapheme-phoneme correspondences, right? How are letters and sounds related? Phonics, that kind of thing. Morphemes, in other words, a morpheme is the meaningful part of a word. We'll get to a definition and some examples of that in a second. But recognition of morphemes, parts of words, is really central in becoming a fluent, proficient, fast reader. Now, the more automatic these processes are, the less cognitive load you have to invest in them, and the more cognitive resources can be focused on other aspects of the reading process, such as comprehending what you read, evaluating what you're reading, uh, reacting to what you're reading on an emotional level, making connections to other things that you've read before, other parts of this text, other things that are going on in the world, uh, right? But the foundation is so very important, and that's why phonics and recognizing morphemes is so crucial because you, in order to do all of these more sort of uh, advanced integrative things, you have to have a really strong foundation in just all of this uh, recognizing stuff happening in the background. It's kind of like, okay, I'm a, I'm a very bad piano player, but even so, if I didn't have some sort of basic technique, I wouldn't be able to play like the uh, you know, Bach well-tempered clavier or something. You really do need a strong technique to be able to attack something like that, and the same goes for reading. You need a foundation in uh, the uh, phonological awareness, morphological awareness, and all of these uh, foundational things before you can really integrate that into the reading process. So reading is far more than decoding from letters to sounds, although this is super important at the early stages of reading. But a naive and mostly incorrect view of reading 
would say that people read one letter after another, you figure out what sounds those letters make, you put those together, uh, and then you figure out what the word is that you're reading. And that's really, mm, that happens uh, early on. Uh, it allows us, we can fall back on that if we come across a word that we don't recognize, but that's really only part of the story. What we see in normally progressing readers is that once you get into the later elementary school and middle school years, you transition from a phonological approach, so one based in this idea of, of uh, one sound, how do the sounds map together, to noticing the parts of words, right? Uh, noticing what words are made up of. And what words are made up of, those parts are called morphemes. So slide six, let's talk about morphology in English. So morphology is the structure of words. And English words, uh, every English word is comprised of a stem, one or more stems. And stems also can have affixes added to them. So you can have prefixes, right? You can have um, um, happy, when prefix un gives you unhappy. You can have suffixes, you know, truth, with the suffix full, gives you truthful. Uh, and those are the basic parts, the basic units of meanings of words are called morphemes. And in English, those are stems and affixes. Now what's really interesting is kids come to understand morphology long before they even start learning to read, right? There's a lot of, uh, of things that kids bring to the reading process based on their unconscious knowledge of how language works. And one of the coolest studies, which if you've ever taken an intro linguistics course, I'm sure you've, you may have even had to replicate if you had a three-year-old around your house. But there was a psychologist in the late 1950s who did what has been known as the WUG study. And the basic idea here, what she did was she showed a picture of uh, like a bird-like creature to a, a three-year-old kid and said, this is a wug. And then she showed a picture of two of these bird-like creatures and said to the kid, okay, now there are two of them. There are two, and the kid goes, wugs, right? So again, the example here, this is a nonsense word. The kid has never heard the word wug before, but yet because of the patterns that their brain has picked up, even by age three, they're able to add a z to this to get wugs to make the plural. Right? No three-year-old probably could say you know, what even the word plural means or how you do it, but uh, they don't know. Uh, even if you can't say what you're doing, you can do it. And that's generally true of, of the structure of English words. People have an unconscious knowledge of morphology, how it works, what goes together with what, what the parts are, even if you don't articulate it. So a next question on this slide, how many past tense suffixes are there in these words, walked, sauntered, perambulated. Okay, it's kind of a trick question, right? In spoken English, there are three suffixes here. T for walked, the voiceless, d for sauntered, and id for perambulated. Now what's cool about English writing is that all three of these, even though there are three uh, sounds for the English past tense, t, d, and id, there's only one form in the writing system, right? That's ed in the, uh, there are of course irregular forms, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about the regular past tense ending. It's written as ed, no matter how it's pronounced. So seeing this ed, and it's even cooler in braille because there's a symbol for it, right? Seeing this ed allows you to immediately make this form to meaning pairing, ah, here's a past tense. So you recognize the stem, you recognize the past tense. That is the advantage that morphology gives you in, uh, in reading, is that you can, um, you can easily map forms onto meanings. Now, same is true with the word pairs that are also on the slide, magic and magician, right? They're pronounced differently, but the, the stem here, magic, is spelled exactly the same way, whether it's magic or magish. In sign and signal, uh, the, your morphological awareness would tell you, okay, look, it's the same spelling, so it's the same stem, even though it's pronounced very differently. So the identification of meaningful word parts is crucial in the reading process, in, in being a fluent 
productive reader. And there's decades of studies showing that morphology matters for print readers. Now, the, this brings us to the question on slide seven, and that is, does morphology matter for Braille readers too? The answer is yes, but uh, in, in Braille, there is uh, a lot of interaction between morphology and contractions, and that is the question that my colleagues and I uh, have taken up for a recent study that I want to tell you about, to kind of give you an overview of. So uh, moving on to slide eight, uh, we all know this as Braille readers. In many words, contractions Someone, oh, sorry, I'm just being distracted by chat. Uh, I'm announcing the slides as I get to them, so uh, it's probably, you can listen in on that. Uh, in many words, contractions must not bridge morpheme boundaries, right? And so here on the slide and on your handout are how not to contract compound words. So grasshopper, right? You would not use the SH to contract gra, gra shopper, right? You would not use the TH in ant hill. You would not use the WH in rawhide. Well, why not, right? And this is, uh, this is stated really clearly in the rules for UEB. Do not use a group sign which would bridge the words which make up an unhyphenated compound word. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> each of the words in a compound word is a stem. If you bridge the stems, you can't easily recognize what those stems are. You would have to stop and kind of think, what's well, cross shopper? What is that, right? <clears throat> but having the stems immediately transparently obvious allows you to fluently recognize them, which is, again, the advantage of morphology. And the same goes with some other morphologically complex words. You're not allowed to use the contraction in uh, this old chestnut, chemotherapy, right? You don't use the mother contraction in chemotherapy, uh, because, well, mother sort of pops out as a, as a word. Um, and the, the real reason, though, is because it doesn't allow you to instantly recognize the prefix chemo and the stem therapy, right? It interferes with your ability to recognize uh, that word, right? And you know that there's other um, uh, words that are formed with uh, the stem therapy, right? There's aromatherapy, psychotherapy, physiotherapy, and so on. So recognizing the stem, recognizing the prefix are super important in the reading process. Okay, on to slide nine. Uh, in many other words, though, contractions are required to bridge morpheme boundaries. And um, it, this ends up making it so that neither morpheme is recognizable. There's no immediate way to see the word parts, to map the forms to meaning, right? So here we have redouble, which in Braille reads as redouble, right? You see the red and you see ubble, whatever that is. You don't see re and you certainly don't see double. Same with redraw. There is no re apparent in the correctly contracted form of redraw. You see red and you see raw. Mileage, same thing. You don't see the stem mile and you don't see the suffix age. Uh, and there's a few others on the slide too that are similar that, that obscure your ability to recognize the meaningful parts of the word because the contraction bridges the boundary between the stem and an affix. So pandemic, prediction, freedom, weren't, mistook. So <clears throat> again, uh, this is uh, an current aspect of Braille, that there are some words where contractions are required to bridge the boundary between a stem and an affix. What ends up happening is uh, it makes it so that the uh, word parts are no longer transparent. You can't just see them and move on. Now, there's two things I want to say here. First of all, uh, notice I have not ever, ever, ever used the term syllable bridging. And syllable bridging seems to be when people talk about this in the Braille world, what what you call it. And uh, syllables are not the issue here. We're talking about morphemes, the parts of words, the meaningful parts of words. The second thing I want to say is this is not new to UEB. I am not bashing UEB here. Uh, there's been uh, morpheme bridging around in various forms in all of the precursors to UEB. So in fact, one of the contractions that was deprecated, the ALLY contraction, uh, was notorious for bridging the boundaries between the stem and the ly suffix, real li, right? Additional li, final li. 
those were bridged with the ALLY contractions. So good riddance as far as I'm concerned for ALLY. So our question, our research question here is do contractions that bridge morpheme boundaries interfere with fluent braille reading and writing? This is slide 10 that this question is on. Do contractions that bridge morpheme boundaries interfere with fluent braille reading and writing? And we can use uh, methodology and tools from the reading sciences to get answers to this question. There have, in fact, here's slide 11, been previous research that looked into this. So uh, Fischerbaum and Engelbretts in 2016 showed that uh, proficient adult braille readers take longer to recognize words, and they recognize these words with more errors when a contraction bridges a morpheme boundary. There was an earlier uh, PhD dissertation done um, looking at braille in the United Kingdom by uh, a researcher named uh, Christina Lauenstein. Uh, she was German. She did her research in UK schools, uh, 2007, and her work demonstrated a lot of things, but for our purposes here, she demonstrated that a word structure has a greater influence on Braille users than do the, the things that they were explicitly taught about the rules for how to use Braille contractions. So, for example, Braille writers were more accurate when contractions corresponded to morphemes, so when the ED corresponded to a past tense morpheme, than they were when contractions did not, when they just happened to be two random letters in a word. Now, what about the effect of bridging morphology on young children learning Braille? And that is uh, the question that our research team um, this is slide 12. It's a picture of each of us, Kay Holbrook at University of British Columbia, uh, me at Rice University, and Simon Fischerbaum also at Rice University. Uh, the question, we're asking this question about young Braille learners, whether uh, we can see an effect of bridging morphology on their spelling. Now, how did we do this? Slide 13 on slide 13. So the materials we use for this are four years of the Braille Challenge spelling contests. And just briefly for those of you, I think most of you probably know what the Braille Challenge is, but essentially it's a contest sponsored by the Braille Institute of America uh, where students from grades first through 12 uh, do activities like um, they do spelling tests and Braille from dictation and reading comprehension and proofreading and, and that kind of thing. It's an annual contest that uh, students in grades 1 through 12 engage in. And what's really neat about this from a research perspective is you've got all these kids across the U.S. and Canada that are doing exactly the same thing. They're all writing exactly the same words at each level for the spelling contest in a given year. They're all writing Braille from exactly the same passage in the dictation contest at a given level in a given year. So you have at, uh, at your fingers here a large corpus, a research database of Braille as written by hundreds of kids each year. Uh, you can uh, analyze a contest across uh, in a given year. You could look at uh, the longitudinal development of children and their use of Braille from year to year. And uh, as part of the, the project that Simon and Kay and I are working on, we are uh, digitizing uh, seven years of the Braille challenge tests. They're de-identified, so no one can trace them back to who the student was or anything like that. And that will be available for Braille researchers to use. We're, I'm calling it the Braille Challenge Research Corpus. It's not available publicly yet, but it should be in about two years when our grant finishes up. So for the study that we did that I'm going to tell you about, we used uh, the 2018 through 2020 apprentice preliminaries, so grades one and two, for the Braille Challenge Spelling Contest, and the 2018 through 2021 freshman preliminaries, so grades three and four. That means we had seven spelling tests. There were 40 words on each spelling test, so that was uh, 280 words. Uh, in the, the test that we analyzed, we only are looking at students that were not marked as below grade level, so we, we wanna make sure that they're on grade level. So there were 355 students who took at least one of these tests. Some did so across multiple years. Um, and we focused on one cell contractions and looked at, it, there are naturally some words in the Braille challenge spelling contests where we see morphological bridging. And there were five of these 
uh, word tokens in the 280 words that we looked at. So uh, uh, we had uh, freedom, that occurred twice. So we looked at each instance of the word freedom where the stem free and the suffix dumb are bridged with the ed contraction. We had weren't, which is really interesting because the stem were and the suffix nt are bridged by the en contraction. We have prediction, where the prefix pre and the stem diction are bridged by the ed contraction. And we have mistook, where the prefix miss and the stem took are bridged by the uh, st contraction. But then also, we have 24 other words that we can compare this to, where the very same contractions occur tautomorphemically. That basically means in a morpheme, not crossing a morpheme boundary, but within a single morpheme, and also in the middle of a word. So they're comparable. So you have, for example, tragedy, where the ed contraction occurs uh, word medially, but doesn't bridge a morpheme. And you can compare, say, tragedy with freedom. And are there any differences in, in kids' um, correct responses across those words, right? Freedom is morphologically bridged, tragedy is not. Or uh, can, you can compare mistook and mysteries. Are there any difference in those? Or, um, uh, um, uh, and so on. So the directions that the kids get for the spelling test, they write each word, they are instructed to write, write each word first in uncontracted braille and then in contracted braille. So what we did was we're looking only at those answers where the kids spelled the uncontracted form using the letters that make up the contraction, right? So if, if we were, say, looking at the WH contraction and the word was whirl, W-H-I-R-L, we would make sure that the kids spelled WH in the uncontracted form, and then we look to see, well, the, then did they use the WH contraction in the contracted form? So the uncontracted spelling is a baseline uh, to determine the kids' correct use of contractions. So the goal of the analysis is to determine whether these kids are less likely to correctly use contractions when they bridge morpheme boundaries than when they do not. So what, is the, what are the differences and errors that we see between the five words that have bridging contractions and the 24 words where these very same contractions don't bridge morphemes? And here on slide 14 are our research questions. So uh, what psycholinguistic variables correlate with correct contraction use? I'll talk about that briefly in a second. Did participants fail to use contractions correctly to a significantly greater extent when the contraction bridged a morpheme boundary as compared to when that same contraction occurred tautomorphemically? So when, when it did not bridge, when it occurred in the middle of a stem. And finally, is this difference due to morpheme bridging or is it, due, or is it predictable based on other variables? And I don't have time to go into the stats or our models or all of those things. Uh, this should be published later this summer. It'll be open access, we think. It's in the peer review process now, so when, when that happens, I can let Natalie know and she can email those of you that are interested or you can, you can email me. But the kinds of other variables we looked at were things like the frequency of the word, the frequency overall of the particular contraction, whether the word was near the beginning of the spelling test or near the end, because people get tired and may, may make more mistakes later on, uh, and other uh, similar variables that we wanted to tease out and say, if we find a difference between bridged and non-bridged error rates, is that due to the fact that there, there's morphological bridging, or can it be attributed to something else? And uh, just here um, is the quick summary of our findings. So there were 203 um, words, right, uh, word tokens. So all of the five instances done by all of the students that got the uncontracted form right. Uh, in the 203 student spellings of words with bridged contractions, only 50 of them, so 25% of the word tokens contained co correct contraction use. So uh, kids contracted correctly only 25% of the time when there was bridging involved. Uh, on the other hand, in the 1,040 student spellings where those same contractions occurred tautomorphemically, so not bridged, 
690 of them, so 66% of the tokens, are correct. So that is a big difference, <laughs> right? Big difference, 25% versus 66%. Okay. In other words, a student is significantly more likely to get an item wrong on a Braille challenge spelling contest when it is a morphologically bridged word than when that word uh, has the same contraction in a non-bridged environment. And uh, the effect of morphological bridging on contraction use is well beyond the effects of the other variables that affect contraction use overall. And again, details will be in the, in the publication version that's coming out. So when kids are doing this, their, their spellings are representing morphological structure, even when the rules for Braille and even when the words that they're reading are, would not do that. So kids, and I'm not surprised at all by this, morphology matters to these kids that are spelling these words. Okay, on slide 16 is a super complex figure that we're not gonna have time to talk through, but uh, you have, uh, access to this. There's a um, full text description in, in the Word file. But this shows basically uh, item by item what the correct, uh, what the rate of correct contraction use is by percent. It compares item by item so you can you can look at this. So for example in the uh, the upper left plot uh, on this figure looks at the ED contraction and if you look at the word prediction we see that prediction, the ED contraction, was used only 15% of the time, whereas if you compare it to a word like tragedy, the ED contraction in tragedy was used 62.5% of the time. And this figure shows, uh, shows the rate of contractions on a word-by-word -word basis for all of the words that we looked at. Again, I'm not gonna um, bore you with the, with the stats or the model, but this is, this is huge. This is hugely significant differences between correct contraction use in bridged contexts versus non-bridged contexts. All right, slide 17. Uh, what does this tell us? Well, morphology matters in English Braille. When the rules for contraction use come into conflict with morphological structure, young Braille spellers tend to follow the morphology, and this leads to errors in Braille usage, right? Kids follow morphology when they're writing, not the rules that they're learning, right? Reading and writing Braille is not simply a matter of coding and decoding contractions independent of other linguistic factors. What do I mean by that? Well, so there may be this idea that, that a contraction is simply a contraction, and you use it whenever those letters would occur together in print. But what this shows us is that that's not, words don't have flat structure. The same contraction is not equal in all parts of the word, right? If it were, if this were simply a matter of when you see ED or the ED contraction, you uncontract it to ED no matter what, or when you are spelling a word with the letters ED in it, you use the ED contraction. If that were the case, if it were simply a matter of a flat structure where you use ED every time ED occurs, uh, then the, the contractions that cross morpheme boundaries would not show the differences in usage accuracy from these same contractions occurring uh, elsewhere, right, where they don't bridge. Though so in sum, our findings clearly show that braille reading children in grades one through four must rely to some degree on morphological knowledge to determine the use or non-use of contractions, right? If these children were not sensitive to morphological structure, then we would not expect to find the significant differences in contraction use across bridged and non-bridged contexts that are so clearly evident in our data. So um, you can look over the, that big figure uh, later. I'll put it back up in our discussion section. But uh, our last slide here is uh, our slide 18, the funding statement and acknowledgments. And uh, I apologize, I've gone about five minutes over time, but uh, slide 19 here, I think there's still plenty of time for discussion. I'm going to move back to slide 16 for this figure, if people want to talk about it. But uh, I um, thank you for your attention, and I look forward to uh, question and answer. 
thank you very much. That was both, that was fascinating research and really informative presentation. And uh, so that was, uh, that's great. We we're really glad that you could be here with us today. So thank you again. And at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Anthony so that he can moderate the uh, Q&A time. Thank you very much. We have one hand up now, uh, Natalie Osborne. Yes, hello. Thank you very much for the presentation. That was absolutely fascinating. And it's got my brain all a tingle. Um, <laughs> That's a morphologically complex word. There's a prefix ah and the stem tingle. That's great. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, you know, forgive my ignorance. I, I do teach Braille, but I, am, mm -hmm. I have not yet learned uh, contracted Braille. So mm -hmm. I am not familiar with contracted Braille, but I, I have sort of a million dollar question. Um, if if you can demonstrate that there is a big impact when these um, these contractions are bridging morphemes, mm -hmm. I would be curious to know why would we not then avoid contracting in that way, particularly mm -hmm. when working with young children, um, you know, who are trying to build their literacy skills? Mm -hmm. Is would there not be a way to just ensure that you know a word like freedom would not be contracted in such a way as to as to bridge that gap? Well, sure. I mean, you could just say, don't use contractions when they cross morpheme boundaries. It would be quite a straightforward fix. Uh, I'm not, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to say whether or not that should be done. But yes, in answer to your question, that would certainly be doable. And I think it's especially doable because we already recognize that the stems of compound words should not be bridged. So it's a very short step to saying, don't bridge the stems of compound words to don't bridge the meaningful parts of words in general, whether the, the stems of two, two words in a compound or whether they're the prefix and the stem or the stem and the suffix. It certainly would be possible to say, don't bridge these. So in answer to your question, yes, that would be possible. I'm, I'm not here to say whether it will be or can be. That's not what I do. Thank you. Uh, Betty? Yes. Hi, Robert. Hi. I, I was I was wondering if there was any difference uh, based on the age of the child. So, mm. for example, a difference mm -hmm. between someone, a child in grade one and a child in grade four yes. in terms of the contractions, you know, you and mm -hmm. the morphology of it. Well, yeah, in terms of contractions overall, actually, right, that's one of the variables that we looked at it in terms of overall contraction use. And we found that uh, older children used contractions more accurately than younger children. And that was true across, uh, it was, there were no significant differences in that usage, whether that was bridged or not bridged, right? Uh, that variable did not um, explain the, the differences in the bridge versus not bridge context. But yes, overall, uh, and this is not at all surprising given this is true for print reading children as well, children, the older children who'd been reading and writing for longer overall did better, <laughs> and in this case did better with contraction use. So yes, e exactly. But it didn't impact the bridging issue. Well, At least they, uh, they were fairly constant mm. all the way across for, on the bridging issue for the those yeah, it, it impacted older children mm -hmm. it impacted the bridging issue but not to a degree that was significantly degree. different than just the fact that they were older and everything was better in terms of braille use when they were older they Thank were you. still not they were still not contracting across bridge morphemes. They, they they weren't like getting significantly better at that as mm -hmm. compared with everything else but yeah, that's Thanks. that's what I meant, and I didn't explain it very well when we were talking about other variables that may have uh, predicted this. But th that was a great question. Next, we have Monique Mariani. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, great. Okay, it works. <laughs> okay. Um, it's more a remark than a question that I will make, and maybe I will be the only one to think that I don't know. But to me, and I am going to use a very strong word, it's a crime to teach contractions so very early to children. I think that children should be taught uncontracted well to the age of nine or 10 and then begin contractions because there are so many things that they miss. I mean, for example, spelling. If they always see dot five M for mother, for example, how are they going to know how the word mother is spelled? Mm. So well, let me respond to that because yes. that that um, is a myth, 
And there's been okay. really good evidence-based research that deals with this myth. And that was done by Kay Holbrook and Rob Wall, em Wall Emerson and uh, a few other people as part of uh, what is known as the ABC Braille study that APH sponsored, the alphabetic uh, and Braille versus contracted Braille. And they looked specifically at this issue and who were the readers. They, they had um, a longitudinal study of, of students. You can, you can read about this if you want the articles. Uh, you can send me an email and I'll send you the references. But what they found was that the students who learned contracted Braille from the beginning overall progressed better in their literacy. They were faster readers. They had more comprehension. They were better, or they were equally good spellers to the kids that started out with uncontracted Braille and switched to contracted Braille. And I would say the reason for that, one of the reasons for that, is that they suddenly didn't have to relearn a whole writing system halfway through their schooling, right? They, they learned that the uh, T-H-E symbol was the from the very beginning. They didn't have to suddenly relearn. And what's really important in developing the automaticity and fluency of, of reading is uh, lots and lots of examples and consistency. So uh, starting with contracted Braille from the beginning is uh, y yields better Braille outcomes I think their study was so very clear about that. And, and um, I kind of also think that the people who are worried about starting with uh, that, that somehow contracted Braille is going to mess up the kids, most of those people are sighted teachers. They're not the students themselves. And I, I think that this is one of those really kind of um, myths about Braille that needs to just go away because uh, what the evidence shows to say in, in the ABC Braille study is very clear that it is not a crime to start with contracted Braille. May I, may I just give a very quick, a very quick intervention? First of all, I am blind and I am a, mm -hmm. blind, I am a Braille teacher. Uh, and I was taught uncontracted Braille till the age of nine and then contracted Braille that I learned very quickly. But uh, I, anyway, I would really be interested in receiving the articles. Mm -hmm. Yes, so okay. I will listen to you. Yeah, Thank I mean, the danger that, that we have in, uh, in research on Braille is that people uh, generalize from their own experiences. And they think, well, I did it this way, so it must be the right way to do it. And uh, in the reading sciences, we want to ask these questions from, uh, from a broader perspective, from larger scale studies, from experiments, and so on, so that decisions about Braille are not made on uh, one person's experience or another no, no, person's experience. Not. I understand mm -hmm. that. But yeah. would you say, for example, that also for adults that are losing their sight, it would be better to to teach contract uh, uncontracted Braille practically immediately? Well, them? I think that's a different population, right? That's a population of people that already read. Their right. reading systems are pretty set, and they're used to spelling things a certain way. So I'm I'm not... Uh, that, that wasn't the original question. The original comment right. was about children, and, that's, and right. that's a very different thing. So adults, mm -hmm. there's uh, research on that, and you know, adults are already, uh, most of them anyway, are already readers. So it's a totally different uh, can of worms or, mm -hmm. or bucket of contractions, as it were. Right. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's one way of putting it. Okay, we've got lots of hands here. So let's try to, uh, we'll, we'll try to uh, get to as many questions as we can. Uh, Peg? Oh, thank you very, very much. This has been a really wonderful presentation, and I really appreciate what you've said and explained about the morphology. And it is really interesting to know that with the brailing of words that involve morphemes, like redo mm -hmm. and yep. all of those, that the children are inherently brailing them without that contraction that bridges those uh, two components. I mean, I've never liked words like that bridged, and, and it's because I'm a Braille reader, I guess, from a more cosmetic standpoint. But that's, <laughs> but when I hear this, it sort of really brings to home that bridging is, is kind of a barrier in terms of learning, you know, how to recognize the word as it should be mm -hmm. produced. But I don't know. I'm, I've got so many strong thoughts about bridging. I shouldn't go there. But anyways, mm -hmm. I really appreciate what you say, and it really supports that perhaps bridging was taken too far. A, a bridge too far. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, so we we see we see very clearly that for these kids, uh, bridging matters. We see in the adult data, and I talked to I. 
talked about this in uh, 2016 at the ICEB meeting, right? Uh, Simon Fisherbaum and my article uh, looking at how adult Braille readers react to bridged words, that they, uh, that adult Braille readers also um, make significantly more errors and take longer to recognize words that have bridge morphology than not. So right. it's, um, yeah. you know, it's uh, eventually you, you um, presumably would, would recognize a lot of these words, they'd become irregular forms, but I, I think your description of these as, as a barrier is yeah. true. Like, you know, I kind of think I, I used to have, well, there was a tree right outside my back door that every time I walked outside, I would, you know, get hit in the face with a bunch of wet leaves or something. And it's like, well, I should just remember that that tree is there and I should duck. But maybe the better solution is to like cut the branch off that keeps hitting me in the face, right? It's not insurmountable, but uh, it just causes, um, it causes um, hiccups in the, yeah in fluent reading in the pla the past braille codes you know i think mm -hmm. they must have taken morphology into consideration when they designed mm -hmm. those rules maybe. well not uh, again I, I it's not a ueb thing there were mm -hmm. so I, I said this at a conference and it made all the all the brits laugh but uh, you know british braille prior to ueb was a lot more promiscuous in terms of contraction use than than uh, english braille american edition was um, but English Braille American Edition also had some promiscuity with contractions that crossed morpheme boundaries. And like I said, the ALLY contraction was a prime example of that. Oh, yes. mm -hmm. So it's not a UEB thing, but yeah. it's something that we have to contend with, I think, more broadly. What is, what, how does Braille reading and writing work? And, and what is the relationship of morphology? It's very similar, it turns out, to uh, the relationship between morphology, the um, how print readers also deal with morphemes. Yeah. Right. There's been a, about 25 years of work in the reading sciences in print reading and writing on morphology, but not yet in Braille. So we're trying to change that. Thank you for the question, though. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for all the questions. We we still have more hands, but we're kind of running out of running out of time. This discussion could go on for a long time because there's a lot to unpack here uh, about braille about the code about all the complexities that come around with changing contractions and and what that means for everything and uh i think this was very interesting for everything everybody